All right, good morning, church. How are you doing this morning? Good. That is so good to hear. It is getting chilly out there in the evenings, and uh, we are staying nice and warm in our home, which is great. My name is uh, Ryan Clement. I'm one of the pastors on staff, as Juno mentioned, and uh, it is my joy, honor, and privilege to get to be before you. I love getting to read and study the Word of God and get to share. I'm very aware of the, the privilege and the burden of really opening up the Word of God and presenting it in a way that we can really hear from the Lord this morning, not just from myself, and to really understand it and what it means for our lives. So I'm looking forward to that. Well, I can't believe that we are only nine days away from Christmas. And it seems like it's come so quickly, even though Thanksgiving was a little early this year, so I feel like it gave like a little bonus time. Um, I, I know some of you were celebrating before Halloween, you were already like, Christmas songs. And uh, you guys are just hardcore. I'm not quite that advanced, but I definitely embrace Christmas. I, I definitely feel in the Christmas spirit. You know, we have so many traditions and events and experiences that really help to get us in that Christmas experience. I know in our family, some of the things that we've done, uh, we've decorated our house with lights. And so we have a bunch of lights on our house. And Judea was actually helping me to decorate those things. And now he did a little bit more of the kind of standing around and say, Daddy, Daddy, oh, over here. no, Judea, come over here. Oh, no, let's do this. Let's do that. And uh, he put them on the floor. But together, we came up with some amazing things. Uh, Hartley's done a great job decorating our home. And she's kind of the, the master of the tree. I tried the first few years of our marriage to put ornaments up. But after them constantly being rearranged, I just decided, let's just let her do it. She's doing a great job. Um, we've done some cookie decorating with my mom, which was a lot of fun, and even some Jingle Bell eggs, which I had never heard of, with my mother-in-law, which was also a ton of fun. And there's still more festivities to be had, so it's, it's definitely crazy. Um, one of the things that I've really loved doing with Judea is we bought a little nativity set this year, and we acted out the little people. So Hartley and I got to share with Judea the Christmas story. Now, if you know my son, even though he's three, he thinks he's the boss of the house. So the nativity sharing sort of went like this. And then Judea, the angel came. No, no, no. The donkey came and said, uh, no, no, there was no donkey here, son. There was an angel trying to talk to him. No, no, no. But then the people, like he kept interrupting us to tell us the nativity story, even though he had never heard it uh, from our perspective. But that was still a ton of fun uh, to get to do. One of the really cool things about having kids that I didn't quite anticipate was you get to look at the world through new eyes. Things that you were once excited about but kind of grew older and got over, you're seeing them from a fresh perspective. And I love seeing how excited Judea gets about Christmas, about lights, about Disneyland, about animals, about meeting a dog walking in the neighborhood. He gets so excited about so many things and it kind of just refreshes me and it refreshes us and reminds me of how great this world really is um, through the eyes of a child. And that's sort of what we're doing with our Christmas series uh, during Advent here is it's called Perspectives because we're looking at traditional Christmas narrative through the non-traditional characters in that narrative and looking at different perspectives of Christmas. So today we're actually going to be talking about King Herod. Now, I don't know if that gets you excited, but it got me excited. So excited, in fact, I ended up at the library this week to study all about King Herod. Um, if you know me, I'm not there too often. And I actually made a really cool post on Instagram saying, wow, it only took me till age 30 to really learn how to utilize the library. And unfortunately, Hartley reminded me when I got home, honey, you're 31. <laughs> I was like, I am? When did this happen? I've officially joined the What's My Age Again Club. And um, that, that was a rough to, to really admit that I, I, was, I was off there. But, so we're looking at King Herod this morning. It's going to be a, a little bit of a history lesson. So I hope that excites you. And then we're going to talk about Jesus. We're going to talk about peace. Uh, would you just bow your heads and pray with me uh, before we open the word? Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your presence and your power. And we pray that you would continue to pour out your peace on us. Help us to hear this morning, to receive and to embrace all that you have for us, God. We just declare that we need you and we cannot do this life alone. Thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we pick up the, the Christmas story in Matthew chapter 2, and we're going to look at uh, the birth of Jesus. So Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, says this. 
After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and they asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they replied, Jesus is born. The Magi visit King Herod and and King Herod is incredibly disturbed. So we're gonna look at Herod and we're gonna look at Jesus, but in order to really understand why Herod is so disturbed and why he's upset, we need to jump into a little history. So let's talk about the Roman Empire. Anybody here Roman Empire fans? Okay. So the Roman Empire uh, was officially started about 30 years before Jesus' birth. So it's interesting that at Jesus' birth, the Roman Empire is relatively new. Now there was a lot going on. There were a lot of territories and civil wars. And so the Roman Empire had been forming for a long time before this, but it was solidified and it was unified with a new official leader, Caesar Augustus, about 30 years before the birth of Jesus. It took a ton of what we would call like all around the Mediterranean was sort of um, the Roman Empire. So south of Europe, north of Africa, and over in Jerusalem and all that. So the Roman Empire was, was very large. And so during this time, Caesar Augustus became the one supreme, supreme ruler and leader of the Roman Empire. Now, he's the one that declares the census, as we've heard in the Nativity story. The reason why Mary and Joseph have to go to Bethlehem is because there's a big census declared. Well, that's the boss of the Roman Empire, Caesar Augustus. Now, what's interesting about Caesar Augustus is he wanted to have a good reputation. And in order to do so, he sends out news and propaganda and writers and makes these big performances and pronouncements about his own reign saying this, that he was the savior of the world, that he was the son of God, that he was the bringer of peace, that there was good news that Caesar Augustus is here. So what's really interesting is when the birth of Jesus comes about 25 years later after Caesar Augustus, the writer of Luke uses that same language to pronounce the Messiah, the coming of Jesus. The same language that that Caesar Augustus promoted um, is promoted with Jesus. Now, Caesar Augustus has one of his homies, Herod, and Herod is the strong military leader who takes control over Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Galilee, kind of like this whole section. And King Herod is a very strong military leader. He's very wise, he's very powerful, uh, and he's a big builder and he's a big developer. What's interesting about King Herod is that if you read about him in history books, they talk very highly of him. He brought control, he brought peace, he developed the world, he built amazing things. But if you read about Herod in scripture, it was that he was evil, that he was uh, brutal, that he was crazy, that he was very rigid. And so we have these two very different perspectives. Now, King Herod started his reign about the beginning of the Roman Empire, and he dies just after the birth of of Jesus. Some of the things that he built were, um, he built aqueducts that brought water into the cities. He built great temples to all of the different pagan gods. He built great amphitheaters and performance centers and banquet halls and temples and all kinds of things. But this is how he did it. This is what the Roman Empire would do. They would come into your territory. They would take over your land They would take over your people. They would enslave the people. Then they would tax everybody like crazy and they would tax everything. They would tax the food that you bought. They would tax the stuff you bought. They would tax roads. Like, hey, you want to cross the street? You got to pay me some money, right? They would tax even the air you breathe. Okay, maybe not that. Maybe that's exaggeration, but they taxed everything and they taxed them so much. That's how they built all their things. So with the rule of Herod in the Jerusalem area, all of the people who had land, who had wealth, who had stuff are getting poorer and poorer and poorer and more and more oppressed. And all of these temples are being erected to other foreign gods. And so the time in Jerusalem is very hostile. The way that Herod declares 
peace is through military reign and rule. He just simply dominates. If you try and rise up against him, he just kills you and your family, right? If you try to not pay taxes, he, he just takes everything from you. Uh, that was his version and his variation of peace. So he was very forceful, he was very intense, and the Jews really didn't like him. What's funny, though, is he was Jewish himself, not by heritage, but he embraced the faith. So he kind of did this thing where he's like, hey, I'm the boss now. Oh, praise Yahweh, you know, I'm Jewish too, just like you guys. And, but everybody knew this was fake. Everybody knew that, that this was a hoax, that he was just trying to uh, get in with the people. Now, what's interesting about King Herod also is that Caesar Augustus, the ruler of the Roman Empire, called King Herod the king of the Jews. That was his official title. So King Herod is the one known as the king of the Jews, and everybody in the land knows that. So in Matthew 2, when the Magi show up and say, hey, we saw the star in the sky that just pronounced the birth of the new king of the Jews, Herod is not going, oh, sweet, another king, great, so excited. No, he's angry. He's disturbed. He's frustrated because nobody comes up against Herod. Nobody tries to threaten his rule and his reign. In fact, Herod was so vicious and so brutal that he ended up killing many members of his own family, which we'll get into in a minute. So Herod did not like being threatened. He did not like that there was someone else coming up against him. Now, back to our story. The Magi go and they visit Jesus, and this is what happens. Verse 12 of Matthew 2. And having been warned in a dream... Uh, the Magi, not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get up, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. So King Herod finds out that the Magi didn't report back to him baby Jesus' location. He gets mad. He sends his military to kill every child age two and younger, every male child age two and younger in all of Bethlehem and any of the surrounding areas. There is a giant roundup and a giant massacre. This is the kind of ruler that Herod was. If he was threatened by anything, he completely destroyed him. Now, I mentioned earlier that King Herod was brutal. He had 10 wives. He ended up having two of them executed. He killed three of his own sons because he didn't think they were fit to rule in his place when he died. And another story, a uh, true story, is that he married this woman named Marian May, and she was one of the wealthy, high, upper class in the Jewish um, community. So he married her as sort of a way to kind of get in with her. But her thing was, hey, I will marry you, but my brother over here, he wants to be the high priest. Like, you got to make that happen, and I'll make this happen. You know what I'm saying? And so Herod was like, I'm in. I'm down. So he makes her brother the high priest. Well, guess what? The people hated Herod, but they really liked her brother. So they start talking about him and start worshiping him and getting excited. Great, we have this new high priest. Well, Herod got jealous. And you know what happens if you get on Herod's bad side? Here's what happened. He organized a beach party day. They all went to the water for tons of fun, and they just happened to be playing games in the water. Things got a little too rough, and some of Herod's boys held the high priest under the water in good fun for a little too long, and he died. That's what happened, right? And Herod goes, oh, no, this horrible accident. Oh, I'm heartbroken. And he throws this giant funeral. But basically, he had the dude killed. That's that's how Herod was. He played to the people like he was great, but he was incredibly brutal. King Herod lived his life by casting fear, by overpowering, and by controlling in order to keep his family in charge. Now, King Herod the Great is who we're talking about. Now, let me just say this. When I signed up for this topic, I was like, 
Oh, King Herod. Yeah, I love to research that guy. What I didn't realize is that in the Bible, there's four King Herods. And I was like, which one is this? And so we'll explain just a little bit. And then we'll jump to peace. So King Herod dies just a few years after the birth of Jesus. And his territories are divided amongst three sons. And this is sort of what creates a little bit of space for Joseph and Mary and Jesus who had fled to Egypt to avoid the massacre. When they hear of King Herod the Great's death, they go, okay, it's safe now. Let's go back to Bethlehem. Let's go back to Jerusalem. And so here's what happens. Matthew chapter 2, verse 21, um, after spending time in Egypt. So he, Joseph, got up took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus, who was one of Herod's sons, was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. He went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled that what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. So Joseph, Mary, and Jesus get out of Egypt and go back north up to Jerusalem, but they find out Herod's son, who's even worse, is in charge there. Now, if you didn't know, Bethlehem is just one day's walk from Jerusalem, which is like the capital. So things are going to be real hot around the capital. So they don't go back to to Bethlehem. They go to Nazareth, which is way, way further north, right? Uh, Probably a week or two's journey. So they go up to Nazareth in Galilee, which that section is actually run by Herod's other son, Herod Antipas. This Herod Antipas, hopefully you guys are like loving this because I'm loving this. So I, I hope you're like, yeah, Antipas, Archelaus, the great, they're battling. Choo-choo-choo. Right? So Herod Antipas is a little less brutal than his bro Archelaus, but he's the one who the, the Gospels talk about who beheads John the Baptist. He's the one who, um, when Pontius Pilate, oh, so check this out. So Archelaus, he does a bad job, right? The Romans don't like him, so they kick him out. They institute a new governor system, and they say, we're just going to bring a Roman governor there, which Pontius Pilate was one of the Roman governors during the death of Jesus. So now Jerusalem is run by the governors, and at Jesus' death and, and resurrection, when Pontius Pilate is like on trial with Jesus and he sends him to Herod, it's Herod Antipas who beheaded John the Baptist because technically he's in charge of Galilee, which is where Jesus is from. So that's why he's like, it's not my jurisdiction, go. And Herod Antipas says, I see nothing wrong with him, send him back. So that's Herod Antipas. Now there's another generation of Herods, uh, Herod Agrippa, and then he has another son, Herod Agrippa II. And after that, the Herodian family falls out of favor with Rome and they get kicked out. So that's Herod. That's all their stuff. Now, in the backdrop of brutality is born Jesus, the Prince of Peace. So it's really ironic to me that the Prince of Peace is born in a time where there's so much turmoil and stress and terror. Now, peace is promised through the prophets of the Old Testament. The Old Testament prophesied that one day the Messiah would come, he would make all things new, and peace would reign. So let's take a look at some of the Old Testament scripture. We're going back to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, this prophecy about the Messiah. For to us a child is born, for to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Isaiah wrote this seven, eight hundred years before Jesus was born. And it was prophesied that one would be born and they would be known as the Prince of Peace. Two chapters later, Isaiah 11. Here's a description of what peace will look like. It says this, The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. 
This is a picture of what peace looks like, that there's no more fighting, that enemies will lie down together, will be of one accord, will be of one family. Then we fast forward to Luke chapter 2, which is the pronouncement of Jesus being born. It says this, suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those whom his favor rests. Now let's look at the understanding of peace. So in Hebrew, the word for peace is shalom. Say that with me. Shalom. Wow, you speak Hebrew. I'm amazed. Look at you guys. So like, oh, what's that word? When, anyways. <laughs> I was going to say so intergenerational, but it's like, no, so international. There we go. That's what I meant. Okay. So Peace is the word shalom in Hebrew. And here's what Cornelius Plantingo writes about this word shalom. He says, shalom is the webbing together of God, humans, and all of creation. Injustice, fulfillment, and delight. We call it peace, but it means far more than mere peace of mind or a ceasefire between enemies. In the Bible, shalom means universal flourishing wholeness and delight, a rich state of affairs that inspires joyful wonder as its creator and savior opens doors and welcomes the creatures in whom he delights. Shalom, in other words, is the way things ought to be. Shalom is also defined as wholeness, completeness, soundness, health, safety, prosperity, carrying with it the implication of permanence, a forever thing. Shalom is, it is well. All things are good. All things are working out. There is prosperity. There is blessing. We are united as one. Now, shalom is actually a common greeting. It's a hello and goodbye greeting. And what I love about the idea of it being a greeting is as people meet together and they say shalom, they're literally saying, may peace be on your family. May blessing be upon you. I hope that you are prospering and that you are doing well. And when they part, they're literally saying, may God's peace continue to be with you and to flow from your life and to be a blessing over everything that you are and your whole family. The idea of their greeting was more than just, hey, what's up? <laughs> how you doing? Fine. How you doing? Fine. Right? Like that's how we are. Like all our good I'm good. And so they are wishing and praying that God's blessing would be upon one another. Now, one of the things that I find interesting is there's all of these scriptures about how when the Messiah comes, the child will play with the snake and all will be well. And there will be no more pain or war. But if we look at the last 2,000 years, there still is war. There still is injustice. There still is calamity. There still is division. There still is brokenness. So did the Messiah really come? Was Jesus really the Messiah if all things weren't made well? And here's the answer. Jesus is coming again. Upon Jesus' first coming 2,000 years ago, he brought peace in the form of salvation to all who believe. But Jesus will come again at the end of the world, and that's when everything will be made right. So we are in this transitional stage where peace is sort of introduced, if you will, and it will be finished and finalized at the end of time. So we are responsible to be carriers of this peace. Now, I want to look at the peace that Herod brings compared to the peace that Jesus brings. So here are some ways that, that Herod brought about peace. Number one, he brought about fear. Okay? He would cause fear. What's really interesting is in the history books that I was able to read in the library, you know, I was just amazed at the resources that are in libraries. <laughs> and they have people there that are so helpful. I went and I said, I'm trying to study a guy named Herod. And they're like, ooh, you need an atlas or a dictionary or an insight. I'm like, what are these things? These are amazing. And uh, they had all these really cool pictures. And it was a lot of fun. We should do a library day someday. <laughs> Here I am, 30, 31, and uh, I was thinking too, I was like, you know, I should have been doing this in like high school. Like, I think we had a library in high school. I was like, I should have been going, they probably had great stuff, but yeah, I was, it just took, takes some of us a little more time. 
<clears throat> okay, anyway, so Herod, so it, it talks about Herod in the history books and it says that he brought peace to the land. But you know how he brought peace? Through military rule and oppression. Through I'm in charge and I'm gonna take from you whatever I want and I'm gonna squash any rebellion so that nobody fights against anybody. It was written of Herod and of Caesar that they brought peace. But if you talk to the Jews of the day, there was no peace. There was constant fear. They were afraid of their lives. They were controlled. All their money was being taken and taxed out. It was no peace. Herod also brought control. He dominated every aspect of life. He told you who you had to worship, when you had to worship, who you had to give your money to, how you spent money, what you could do, what you could sell, everything. He dominated everything. And he exercised his power, right? He was in charge. Nobody would come against him. This is his version of peace. And unfortunately, this can be our sinful tendency as well to out of fear do something or be motivated for something or to cause fear to someone else in order to get them to do something we want or to think that we need to control every situation in order for things to be okay, right? That we need to have authority or power in order to make things right. This is how Herod exercised peace. But Jesus does things a little differently. The real prince of peace, the real king of the Jews is born. And this is what he brings. He brings, number one, forgiveness, which is peace with God, which seems kind of backwards from this whole military dominance attitude. But he brings peace with God in the form of forgiveness, and it's free. There's no cost to it. You see, Herod, he charged taxes and all these things for his peace. But for Jesus' peace, all you had to do was repent of your sins and be baptized, and you could be filled with the Spirit. He brings forgiveness at no cost to restore right relationship with God. Because we cannot be at peace unless we are first at peace with God. Until we've been forgiven, until we've been renewed and refreshed, we cannot be at peace ourselves. So the first thing he brings is peace with God. He removes fear and he replaces it with faith and love. One of the most common things of ancient deities was that they were usually worshiped out of fear. You were afraid that the rains wouldn't come and that you wouldn't get your crops to grow, so you worshipped or you gave a sacrifice. Or you were afraid that bad things might happen or you are afraid that good things might not happen. But Jesus changes that. The second thing that Jesus brings is reconciliation. And I put that as peace within ourselves. That we can now be at peace in ourselves because Jesus gives his peace because we have God's presence. John 14, 27, Jesus says this, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus literally says shalom to you. May all be well with you. You have my peace. Jesus distributes the peace of God that surpasses all knowledge and understanding. Do you know that's what the Bible says about God's peace? It's beyond our own comprehension, beyond our own understanding. It is this experience that all is well, beyond our own ability to get there. It's not a simple breathing exercise that we can calm ourselves down to experience God's peace. It's a supernatural presence of the Lord. The third thing that Jesus brings is restoration. And I call that as peace with others. Because we have experienced peace with God, Because we can be at peace with and of ourselves, we can now share that peace with each other. We can pass that peace off. We can give it as a blessing. John 16, 33, Jesus says this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So when we face anxiety, when we face struggles, when we are overwhelmed by all that is going on, when there is injustice, we can have God's peace. Now let me be very clear about something. Peace is not ignorance. Peace is not just let me avoid the injustices going on in the world or in my community and pretend like everything is okay. That's not peace. Peace is actively engaging where there is injustice and participating with God to make things right so that there can be peace. I don't want our pursuit of peace to be uh, um, 
some sort of excuse to not engage where there is lack of peace because we need to go and engage and help people. Now, ironically for me this week, I was just having some times of anxiety where I was struggling and it's like, God, I'm trying to like do a message on peace, but I'm like really stressed out and anxious. And so I found myself constantly this week just praying, God, I need your peace. I need your presence. I need your peace. I need your presence. Just praying that over and over and over. And I just felt God's blessing helping me. And so praying and and receiving that was incredibly helpful for me. So I want to invite the band out as we are are going to wrap up here. But some things to think about uh, kind of going forward, kind of going into our weeks. How we can live out this peace. How we can engage with God. So number one is, is definitely in prayer. Definitely being in prayer and saying, God, I need your supernatural peace in my life. I cannot live this life without you. That's a daily dependency on God and his presence. The second thing is walking in God's commands, like living righteous. There are so many times I think that we are stressed out about something or that we are anxious or that we have a lack of peace because of a sinful decision that we made. And if we're really being honest, not everything, but some of our lack of peace is a result of our own sin. We didn't really obey God with what we did. We didn't really do the right thing. We kind of cheated things there. We kind of ignored that. Uh, We made a bad choice. And so living righteously, doing what is right, will help to bring peace. Uh, trusting God's work in our lives. For me, one thing that has been helpful is looking back on the times where God helped me to get through something as a reminder of how I can get through what I'm currently going through. So we're being reminded of how God has been faithful to bring peace in the past has been incredibly encouraging and restoring for me. The last two things are resolving conflict and honoring others. Now, the funny thing about conflict is we usually think it's the other person's fault and it's not always very resolvable. That's why it's conflict. But as much as we have control to love and to forgive and to make things right and to bring a peace, let's do that. Let's not remain in conflict out of being upset or being agitated or disturbed like Herod, but let's do what we can to make things right. And when it comes to honoring others, I have learned that even when the other person is in the wrong or even when whoever you're working with is just out of their mind, as much as we can try and honor people, it will go better for us and we'll have peace in our lives. So would you bow your heads with me and pray? Father God, we just confess that we need your power, we need your presence and we need your peace. We need your shalom in our lives. Lord, your wholeness, your health, God, make all things new in us. Continue to forgive us, to restore us, to give us strength, and to help us to be distributors of peace everywhere we go. Greeting others with shalom and leaving them with shalom. Lord, let us see every area of our life, how we go to the bank, how we go shopping, how we go to work, how we talk to our neighbors, our friends, our family, as an opportunity to distribute shalom to others. God, we just say we cannot do this life without you. We need your power and your presence, Lord. We thank you and we love you so much. Lord, would you receive our tithes and our offerings this morning as a worship to you, as a giving back, and as a saying thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to start our response time this morning. And as usual, we have some music that we'll get to sing along to and worship. But we also want to encourage you to visit some of our stations. We have our candle stations. If you want to light them and say a prayer for someone else that is in need of prayer. We also have our cross and our Christmas tree uh, back in the corner. If you want to just write a prayer of, of peace and you want to hang that ornament up, that would be awesome. Or if you have a prayer of just saying thank you for God doing something, please do so there. We'll also have our communion stations as well if you'd like to come and partake in in communion and our prayer team will be in the back corner. If you just have any prayer requests and just have any needs for prayer. And at this time, we'll have the ushers come forward to collect our tithes.